How's everybody doing tonight? Tonight, this is my 20th discussion. Tonight I'm speaking with Nathan Ellis of the legendary band Coalesce, uh, the Casket Lottery, Abel Baker Fox. Super stoked to talk to him. Uh, can't wait to hear some stories. Hope everybody's good. Happy holidays. Um, wear your mask. Um, in these times, give your loved ones just a little tighter hug and uh, just try to you know, forgive people that you've had beefs with and stuff like that. Uh, it's a crazy time out there. So I hope everybody's well and I hope everybody's good. And uh, just waiting for him to go on. He's, he's going on on the Casket Lottery uh, Instagram. So just waiting on him right now. But I hope everybody's good. Here we go. Should be on any second. Hey. How you doing, Nathan? I'm doing well. Can you hear me all right? Yep, I can hear you good. Awesome. Uh, I just want to thank you for taking the time out to do this. I really appreciate it. I know uh, both of us, uh, you know, we have a family and daughters and uh, especially on uh, these trying times, uh, it's tough to, you know, get away for a little bit. And uh, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. Sure, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, uh, I actually just got home. My youngest had a, a School of Rock gig today. So uh, that takes some time, you know. Yeah. How did, how did that, how did that go? It was good. You know, it's, um, it's weird. It's weird. Like watching any, any sort of live music right now, you know, and, uh, they had, uh, you know, like shower curtains, like and plexi dividers up on stage and, um, you know, every, everybody's wearing masks and singing and, uh, it's kind of a trip, like a little, little dystopian looking, uh, yeah. but it was a good time. Yeah. Are, the, are uh, they in school now, or uh, are they doing full remote? Yeah, no, neither of my kids have gone to school this year. They they both opted to stay home and do remote uh, school this year. So, uh, and and you know, I I couldn't be happier about that, honestly. Like, I mean, it's it's so crazy. How about you? How about your kids? Yeah, we're uh, full remote too. Um, the only thing that I'm kind of bummed out about is uh, my oldest plays basketball, and and this season's kind of scrapped because of that. Uh, but I mean, I'm glad also because I I wouldn't want her playing and and you know compromising anything. Right. So, uh, but it's just she wanted to play really bad, and and I coached actually. Uh, so it's kind of you know we miss it, but um, I'd rather be safe than <laughs> sorry. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and you know I don't know if if you're kids like know any other kids at, at school who have gotten sick or, or gone down with it but we've seen that here on this side and it's scary you know like yeah you know I'd, I'd rather not have to think about that yeah definitely I, I, I agree I their friends haven't I haven't heard any of their friends that have got it or anybody like in this school but I think uh, some parents have gotten it and actually like um, maybe two houses up from me uh, a lady caught COVID and her little three-year-old son also so I mean it's, oh, yeah. all, it's all around us and and actually at my work there's been people that not directly had it but like say their their you know mother had it and they live with their mother and like so everybody had to get tested and yeah, it's been crazy this year and uh just it's just wild yeah for sure I I um I don't know man I don't really see an end either you know like not to be too negative Nancy but um, like, yeah, I guess, you know, vaccines are coming, but I don't, you know, I don't know anybody who's excited to take a vaccine either, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, me neither. Uh, they they say it, but uh, I'm going to, I'll wait on that. Um, I mean, it took, how long did it take for a chicken pox vac vaccine? 15 years? Uh, yeah. like, or, or was it mumps? I, I know one of them, it took like almost 15 years. I know science and medicine is, uh, you know, gone leaps and bounds now, but uh, still, I'll wait. <laughs> I'll just keep yeah. boosting myself with supplements and, and vitamins and uh, just wearing a mask and, you know, 
washing my hands and trying to stay as safe as possible because I, I'm not I'm not knocking the door down to take that vaccine anytime soon. So same, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to I want to uh, congratulate you on the short songs for End Times um, album that just came out. Um, I listened to it a bunch of times and uh, I I think it's an awesome album. Uh, it kind of takes me back um, a little ways to to your older stuff, kind of, um, which uh, I love. Uh, I'm a huge Moving Mountains fan. Is by far the best thing that the Casco Lottery ever did in my eyes. I, I love it all, but I'm saying that that album uh, alone is is very special to me. And also the dot dot dot. Um, uh, yeah, the first EP. Yeah, the first EP is is yeah. that's the first thing I ever heard from yeah. the Casco Lottery. So uh, I was thrilled at that at that time because. Um, Highball kind of got me in the door because um, I live, you know, I live close to Boston. I live like a, an hour away from Boston and Highball like kind of got, I was like a huge metalcore guy and um, Highball kind of heard uh, sometimes friends fight and it had singing and a little bit of screaming and it kind of changed my mind about things and I really liked it. And then after that, it was just like, I was on a tear to find music like that. And that's where, I came about like finding out about the Casket Lottery and and hot, and hot water music and small brown bike and yeah. Mid Carson July and the Get Up Kids. I kind of just went on like a you know went down the rabbit hole of emo, I guess you would call it. You know, yeah. But back, you know back then, you know, mid '90s, all these bands were playing together. You know, whether we were playing, um, you know, a show with Cave In or Piebald, you know, it didn't matter. You know, that was that was just the the times. You know. I don't think I don't think it's like that anymore. I I, I could be wrong. Like I'm kind of I feel kind of out of the loop. But um, yeah, I mean that that was different times. You know, I I remember plenty of coalesce tours in like '97 '98 where we'd end up on the East Coast and all of a sudden we'd be playing a show with the Get Up Kids and it was like wow this is completely random and awesome you know and um, you know I don't think that sort of gig gets booked anymore you know it's different now yeah yeah definitely um i try to stay up with the the newer stuff i i have a friend named ron who runs runs um his instagram and he's he's uh he just turned 40 but he's into like all the new um you know hardcore uh you know screamo type of stuff and uh he keeps me kind of um you know with all the knowledge of the new bands, which I, you know, I'm old, I'm, I'm going to be 49 in less than a month. So uh, <laughs> I started, um, you know, going to shows when I was 12 years old in Boston. And so it, it's been a long run for me, but I still listen to heavy music and, and everything else. Um, but uh, what I'd like to ask you first is um, when you first got into like punk and hardcore, what kind of drew you to the punk and hardcore um, like music? Well, I was definitely introduced through skateboarding. You know, I think that's uh, a pretty common um, way of getting into punk and hardcore music. And, and I was just hanging out with all the skate kids. And like, you know, then we started watching skate videos and, um, and, and just making tapes for each other. And like, I remember getting um, Misfits, uh, Legacy of Brutality, um, Minor Threat, discography and and um and that was like that was really it like just just hanging out with uh, the skate kids and um and then like just going to shows with them so it was it was that introduction through those kids for sure um and i was always terrible at, at skateboarding i was just the worst you know i couldn't do it I, and um you know i i was just along for the ride but like eventually like i just shifted my focus over in, into music instead and, you know, the first few tours, we'd go out and I'd, I'd bring my skateboard with me. But I, w I started, like, falling so much and hurting my arms and hands that I couldn't play the show, you know. So I was like, <laughs> all right, no more, no more skating. I just got to focus on the music thing. But that was the introduction, for sure, through those kids. Now, was there, was there a big hardcore scene in Kansas City at the time? Or, um, you know, for, for like, metalcore? Because I think most of, um, you know, guys our age... Um, I don't know if it was true to you, but for, I was first kind of like into metalcore and, and hardcore. Um, obviously, I, I was into like the New York hardcore, uh, U True stuff, and mm -hmm. um, the Boston, you know, uh, SSD, and, and eventually Slapshot and stuff like that. Um, was there, when you were younger as a teenager, was there like a, a big metalcore scene in Kansas City? No, I, I mean, I think 
Um, the cool thing about the Kansas City scene is there was plenty of kids here uh, and, you know, younger people making music, but there wasn't one set scene or one set sound. Everybody came to everybody's shows, but, you know, this is, um, you know, this is where Coalesce came from uh, and Season of Risk and the Get Up Kids and Boys Life and Giants Chair and Season of Risk and Shiner, you know, like they're all different sounds. Um, and I, I think the scene here really benefited from that. Um, you know, we were right in the middle of the country. So if any tours are coming through, it's just um, everybody's stopping here, you know, whether it's um, Engine Kid or Snapcase or, um, you know, Codeine, uh, you know, all these bands were stopping here. And it didn't matter um, if, you know, Engine Kid got here the same day that, bloodlet did that was just the show you know yeah. and uh, and then there was the local bands that were hopping on it too you know so um i i feel like maybe we got a more eclectic show each night because of that um but we never did have like one sound one scene you know it was um everybody just went to everybody's shows you know and yeah. i think we i think we we're really lucky to have that so so when you you were young you you liked a variety of, of different kinds of music, right? You you had your hands tapped in all, all different kinds of music then, right? Cause, yeah. Um, uh, um, were you, uh, like, how did you get into Coalesce? I know uh, Stacy left after the Pennsylvania show. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you, you Well, and I was, I was on that. that. Yeah, and I was on that trip with them. And, like, I was just always in the van with them at that point anyway. So... Uh, when he left, it was, uh, I was the obvious choice to, to ask to come and play, even though I'd never played bass before at that point. I'd never even given it a shot. I was always playing guitar, um, but I was around, you know, so it was like, hey, why don't you just do it? And I was like, totally. Yeah, why not? Um, and I, and I loved Coalesce. I love that band. So um, it was, it was exciting for me and, and more than, more than the band, you know, uh, I loved touring. I loved playing music and I loved um, getting in the van and going. And so like, as somebody who was like, I, I was still a senior in high school whenever I joined Coalesce. And in fact, I didn't know if I was going to graduate because I was gone touring so much. Um, I kind of, I just showed up at my graduation hoping they were going to say my name, you know, it was one of those kind of deals. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I was just there. I was just around. So I was the, I was the obvious choice just, because they knew me already, you know. Now, who who was the you, who were you more friendly with to kind of get you like to be a roadie or or you know just to go on tour with them? Was it Jess or was it? Um, it was Stacey? actually it was actually Dan who Dan was um, Dan did Second Nature who put out yep. the the first few records and stuff. So I I knew Dan. He was one of the skateboard kids that I was always talking about, and so like I would just like go with him. So it was always Dan and I were the extra bodies and we were helping the band do whatever, sell shirts. Actually, we weren't helping do anything at that point. We were just showing up and like being in the van with them, you know. Yeah. Uh, but like I met all of those guys through Dan. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it was very easy to connect with all of those guys at that point. Um, even though I was the kid, you know, I was like 15 at that point, And Sean Ingram was... I don't know how much older he is than me. I, I'd say maybe he was 20 and he had a, a baby at that point. Right. Like, so we were in complete different um, parts of our, our lives, but I, it was really easy to connect with him anyways. You know, like these, these were just guys that I was fast friends with and uh, excited to be around. Yeah. Now, um, were you in uh, bands before you joined Coalesce? Like, uh, well, well kind of like in that style or were you more in, into the style of, um, casket lottery when you were playing guitar and not bass before Some, beforehand so i'd say somewhere between like I, I i was playing in bands and it was really just kind of dependent on like who i was playing with and what we were trying to do but like most of the music i was writing before that was somewhere between coalesce and casket lottery i know that's vague but <laughs> it was like right in the middle between the two bands yeah 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 and, and were you a fan of like um uh well Breach was the band before Coalesce, right? Yeah, I didn't. Like, I I wasn't around. Oh, honestly. you weren't around then? Okay, So there was like, because I mean, I was probably like 
2013 when that was happening. You know, like, oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't meet those guys until Coalesce first seven inch came out. It was like when I like I hopped into the scene. I was yeah, like cool. 15, 15 at that point. In, in the first recording you did with Coalesce was the Get Up Kids um, split? That's the first one that came out. That's the first like record that I got in my hand. Yeah. But I think um, at that point in time, we had um, just re-recorded the 002 stuff um, that Get Up Kids split and some other comp songs. Like uh, we did a version of um, Discuss for Details that was on some comp. So like, um, but it wasn't too soon after that that we were writing Functioning on a Patient. That was like right away. Yeah, yeah. And and um, I know a lot of a lot of people. Have, um, you know, I've heard on podcasts and stuff where you know they say, "Oh, the first time I heard Co- Coalesce, I uh, you know I didn't get it at first. Like I just it kind of just went by me and and stuff like that." Um, just on a New England standpoint, for me and and all my friends here is like um, we totally got it. You know what I mean? It, it was like it didn't pass us by because like. Uh, I, the first thing I ever heard from Coalesce was the um, Second Nature uh, cardboard sleeve. Um, it was like five songs, two two live songs on it. Yeah, it was like demos. And yeah. I was I was like hooked then. And then the sound obviously changed a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Give Them Rope, obviously the sound was a little different. But um, it, it it took everybody by a storm up here. And, and you know, everybody loves uh, Converge and Cave In and stuff like that up here. But... Honestly, I'd say maybe a group of 20 of my friends really say that Coalesce is probably their favorite hardcore band uh, of all time, just because uh, there was something about that band that just hooked us and the live performances. I know a lot of people didn't get to see him up here, but um, like I told when we were talking uh, through the DM, I I got to see you guys uh, three times, Uh, once without you playing back, I think it was like 96, 97, but... um, the video that I had uh, put on my page, I think, was from that Springfield show that we were talking about with the uh, barrier around it. And uh, yeah. and then the Clinton Mass show that was in that, that gym at St. John's Gym where, um, I mean, I, I think Brutal Truth was supposed to play that, but Niall ended up playing it, which was, <laughs> which was kind of yeah. weird. Um, those shows... I'm just saying, like, for us up here and the live performances, it just blew us away. And and for me, I had never seen anything like that with the visceral and chaoticness, but still sounding so good. Um, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, like, how did you kind of, like, do your performances? I know you saw it, you know, with Stacy, but how did you, like, you know what I mean? Because you went pretty wild, too, when you played in Cola, so... How how did you, you know what I mean? Were you, like, pressured to be like, oh, I have to be wild like these guys? Or did it just come natural with you? Yeah, I mean, I think it just came natural. You know, that's just that's just the music, and that's just what's happening all around you at that time. So um, it just feels like that's, that's what's happening, and you're just in it at that point. Um, and also, you know, I think that that's one of the reasons the Jets asked me to play in the first place. Like, he'd seen my other bands, and... Um, you know, we weren't, you know, too far away from that. Um, it was, you know, I mentioned earlier that Kansas City doesn't have like one defined sound, but one thing Kansas City always did really well was the noise scene. And I think that that's what people forget when they talk about Coalesce, because most people talk about Coalesce as a hardcore band um, without realizing that like the roots of it were, were from the Kansas City noise scene. It was all about bands like... Um, season of risk and uh glazed baby quitters club stuff like that which you know they all had like roots in kansas city whether or not they were always in kansas city or craw like stuff like that is is really um the thing that kind of made coalesce a little bit different like there was obvious hardcore band uh roots and then there was also the kansas city noise scene roots so um yeah i mean and we all came up in that so um, yeah, it, it just made sense that when we were playing, we were in the same spot, you know, we were in the same place. Yeah. Now, now, uh, Kansas city and, and was Sean from Lawrence, um, Kansas? No, um, none of, none of us are from Lawrence. Uh, Sean lives in Lawrence currently and has for years now, but, um, Sean grew up in Grandview, which is just a suburb of Kansas city. 
Yeah. I grew up in Lee Summit, which is a suburb of Kansas City. Stacy and Jess both grew up in Wyandotte County, which is like North KC. We're all and James was in Liberty, which is a suburb of Kansas City. So yeah. um yeah, I mean we're all Kansas City guys. But Sean's lived in Lawrence for probably I don't know, fifteen years now, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah. So, so you have you've almost recorded everything that Colas has done, besides um, give them rope and and the the earlier stuff in the you know mid '90s, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't do the first seven inch. Um, I didn't do the original zero zero two. We re-recorded that, yep. um, and I did. I wasn't on give them rope, but man, it. I mean, it floored me when I first got give them rope for sure. You know, like that. Yeah. That's still that's still probably my favorite Colas record. Yeah. Uh, um, did, now, what did you think of the remastering of that? Did, did you do you like the original or do you like the remastered version? I, honestly, I don't know if I've listened to it enough. To, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, um, I, I couldn't I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. The interesting thing about that, um, one of the main reasons that Sean and Ed were going to redo some Coalesce stuff specifically on that record is there's a I feel like a dick saying this story, but um, there's a Stacy messes up really bad in, in the first track and they were supposed to go in and fix it. Um, and I'm not going to tell anybody where it is because you'll never find it. It's a yeah. Coalesce song, you know, but, yeah. um, but like, it's still there. They like totally forgot to fix that part and it's like still on the remaster. So uh, it kind of, it eluded them uh, through the remaster, but um yeah, I mean, I honestly, I, I don't think I've listened to the remaster enough to tell you, like, if I can even remember a difference. Yeah, in in between albums when Ox came out, how did how did that come about? Where it what was it a? I mean, it was a good, was it ten years before Ox Ox came out, or was it was it shorter than that? I mean, and how did that come about? Where you know, Jess and and Sean uh, came back to you and were. I mean, were they like, hey, do you want to do this album? Like, how did that come about? Well, so uh, Ox, I want to say, was like 2008. But we started playing again in probably 2006. Uh, that's like when we did the Salt and Passage 7-inch and we did some touring around then. So that was like really when we like got the crew back together. Um, and then I want to say the Relapse record, Revolution, and Just Listening... Uh, was probably 2000 so there was about like a six-year gap there where we weren't playing yeah um and then you know uh i had i invited jess and his family and um and sean and his family to my oldest daughter's birthday party and so like they came out for that and like that's that's what started that conversation going at that point like, hey, you know, like maybe, you know, no pressure. We don't have to like do anything or commit to anything. Let's get together and play. And it was like half a practice in and Jess was like, all right, let's write a new song. You know, it was like, okay, cool. So we're going to, we're going to try this. So, yeah. And I, I mean, Ox is amazing. Like I was, I was skeptical at first because it had been a while, but uh, it, it blew me away when I heard it. Um, and I think the reception was, was, uh, you know, very good for, for that CD. Um, and yeah. So, so how did, um, you know, how did Casket Lottery come about when Coles, you know, were you, were you in both bands or did you leave Coles and then kind of start Casket Lottery in 99 or? Well, for a short period, yeah, I was doing both bands. Um, when, when Stacy was still in Coles and I was, you know, the co-pilot or I was driving, I should say, and Stacy was the co-pilot. We were always, you know, doing the night drives and, listening to bands um that we liked more than any of the other guys like uh you know local Kansas City bands like Boys Life and Giants Chair and or like Discord bands like uh Shudder to Think and Jawbox and bands like that and like eventually we were like hey you know we should you know we should do something like this sometime and so when he left Coalesce and I joined Coalesce um I had mentioned that Sean was in a different place in his life he he had the baby at home and I was the guy who was just excited to go on tour. So um, when we were touring less, um, it, was, it was just kind of time to start that up, you know, and, and we found a drummer to play with us. And uh, so we started Casket Lottery probably in, in 99, 98, 98. And um, 
did a, you know did a lot of writing right away in 99 and, and released a bunch of stuff so yeah i was touring with casket lottery and co in 99 and 2000 yeah and, and wh when were you kind of was the band just kind of uh you know broke up and then you just did casket lot the casket lottery uh full time like after that yeah yeah and you know, that was probably late 99, 2000 when Coalesce like really hit the skids. And, um, and then we finished up that relapse record and, uh, and then we didn't do anything for a long time. So, so that was when Casket Lottery kind of became the main focus. And we, we did a lot, we did a lot of writing and recording and a lot of touring there the first few years. Yeah. Um, with dot, dot, dot and, and choose Braun, was that you guys recorded that in the same year? Uh, am I correct? Yeah, and a ton of seven inches and seven in splits, seven inches and in comp songs and stuff, just a, in an insane amount of stuff. And then Moving Mountains was written um, before we even did the tour for Choose Braun. So, like, we did all of that, like, really quick. We, like, just kind of figured out how to write. And, like, every song we wrote and recorded um, was just a practice to get better, you know? So we just um, just kept going. Like, we were really on fire uh to do that so um yeah we were super productive there from like 98 to 2000 yeah with and toured, that, with, toured a lot with that many like songs uh, like uh like you were saying that the splits with like wax wing and, and mm -hmm. was it Re reflector was the other mm -hmm. split that you guys did um yeah it's incredible just that small amount of time how many songs you pumped out uh, was it kind of like you knew this was like the thing for you and Stacy and the other guys in the band, just, just because you, I mean, uh, I was in bands too, and <laughs> I've never like kicked out that many songs in such a short period of time. I mean, it, it must've been a, a good feeling, to, you know? Yeah. And a big reason that, that we were that productive is because um, we loved being in the studio. We loved working with Ed Rose and we just wanted to like, if somebody was going to give us money to go record, you know, for a split or a comp or uh, the next EP, like we were just going to make sure we were ready, you know, like we wanted to get back in there and be um, productive in the studio and learning new stuff with Ed. That was like our favorite thing, you know? So yeah. um, that was the motivation. It was like more songs means more time in the studio to create something really fun and cool. Yeah. No, yeah, no. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say it, it was, it was all, um, it was all for that moment. Yeah. Um, now what, what kind of, you, you guys did survival as cowards, which, which is like another one of my like all time favorite albums. I, I love that album so much. Um, between like 2001, then you put out a few e EPs and then it, it was a, a, a little bit of time before you put um, real fear out. Mm -hmm. Um, what happened in in that little time? Did you kind of, you know, we working on other things or I know Abel Baker Fox was kind of yeah. in there too, um, maybe 2008, but still, there was still a, a few year gap where I, we didn't hear anything from you. Like, uh, what? Yeah, we just needed a break for sure. We, we were all in different, you know, when you're in a band with people, <laughs> eventually like you all get out of sync a little bit and everybody gets in different parts of their um, own personal lives. And when that happens, it's like you're all pulled in different directions. You have different motivations. You have different things you care about. And um, that definitely happened uh, at that point. You know, we, we put out survival in 2001 and then we put out the smoke and mirrors EP in 2002. And after just touring a shit ton on those two things, we, um, decided we needed to chill out like me personally I had a baby at home you know I didn't like being on the road all of yeah. a sudden anymore even though it was like my favorite thing for the previous yeah. five years it was like this sucks for me now and I don't want to do it um, so like that was the thing and then um, Junior the drummer was the younger guy in the band so obviously he wanted to keep doing other things and he started playing and um Old Canes, I think he did like a tour with Unwed Sailor and, and he joined Appleseed Cast, you know, like he started doing his own thing. Yeah. Um, and like, I just needed to chill out at home for a while. Um, I started playing music around here with some people and then, yeah, and then uh, the Abel Baker Fox thing was the next project after that. And yeah, that was, did you say 08? 
That seems about right. It doesn't, yeah. Two, well, <laughs> you got you guys could have got together before then, but I think the, yeah. the first album you guys did came out in two thousand eight. Yeah. And yeah. Well, and that, and that oh, lined up with the Ox stuff too, right? So that's when like, you know, my my baby was now seven or eight. It was like, all right, like. It's a lot easier now. Like, I can chill out, you know. Like, my wife's not going to kill me if I leave town for a couple of weeks, you know. In fact, at this point, like, get out of the house for a couple of weeks, you know. Yeah. I mean, did, um, you, did you have a fever for that? Like, because you were, you know, it had been a few years and you've been, you know, obviously family life to me and I know to you to you is the most important thing out, yeah. of, any, out of anything. But was there a fever burning inside you that you were like, oh, I got to play out or, or like record, do some recording? More, more so recording and writing. Um, like that's always like my thing. Like that, I, that's my favorite thing. And of course, I like, um, I like playing live shows and I like touring too. Um, but it's definitely hard, um, no matter what. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, when Ox came out, Coalesce did some pretty significant touring for that. Um, you know, we did the full tour cycles. We did Europe. We did all of that. Um, we didn't do anything like that with Abel Baker Fox just because that's another one of those bands where um, two of those guys live in Michigan. I'm in Kansas City. One guy lives in Brooklyn and, um, you know, uh, different, different parts, you know, different lives happening. Uh, yeah. That was just like a fun recording project at that point. So, um, but Coalesce, it was like, hey, we're all ready to do something. So we hit that record pretty hard um, and it was a good time. Um, and then that kind of like opened the door again for Casket Lottery once like, you know, I got back home and I was like, all right, cool. Like now what? And you guys want to do something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and then that, that kind of uh, real fear came out after like Ox and that stuff kind of you, you had your way. Um, that that's when that came out. Right. And, and going back to uh, small Brown bike, obviously you got with those guys because of the split with, with uh, Cas the Casket Lottery and, um, small brown bike is that how you guys kind of became friends or were you friends beforehand uh, yeah then... yeah we, we did a lot of um well that's a that's a band from michigan and and we're from kansas city so like we ended up playing shows together in like chicago and indiana and then eventually like actually not even eventually like immediately we were like best buds we were like brother bands like right away so like after the first weekend of shows together we were like booking the next midwest loop and then it was like cool let's do east coast west coast you know we did a lot of touring with them and so yeah that was the that was the obvious next step was let's do a split and then the split just turned into a collaboration and um it was really um i, I don't know like eye-opening for me personally um to see the way that mike and ben um wrote in that band and it was very similar to the way that that I, I write guitar parts. So like that was, um, that was when I like tucked it away in the back of my mind, I'm going to start a band with these guys at some point. Cause like, I, I fucking love them. They're, they're yeah. the best people. They're the best players. I love when they sing together. Um, so uh, yeah, just working in the studio with them um, was fun, of course, but that like that, that definitely started the, the Abel Baker Fox band, like right at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And did you guys ever, tour at all um as abel baker fox we haven't toured as abel baker fox we've done 12 shows 12 i have shows. them all like written down I, I know where they all are i think most of them have been in chicago or in florida yeah um florida for fest like i think we played fest three times now um, and then a couple shows around fest and then a couple shows in michigan never in kansas city by the way i just have to point that out those dudes have not played a show out here with me yet, <laughs> well so. they, they need to get to kansas city and play hopefully, yeah. hopefully 2021 we get to pull that off that would be all right and, and is there any plans to record um a third album um with abel baker fox in the, in the near future we've we've got a few songs kicking around but we haven't like committed to like all right let's get to work on this thing yeah um but but uh, yes, like, I mean, uh, I have a group uh, text going with those guys all the time. Like, they're like, they're my, you know, they're my dudes. So yeah. uh, we're always kicking around ideas. We just did a, just to, just to do something. We just did a Elvis Costello cover through, awesome. <laughs> through the internet just to do something. And yeah, um, yeah, uh, it, 
it's pretty rough, but it was fun, you know. Yeah, so yeah. What, um, what what was what was the song? Uh, what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. We just decided to do it. So, yeah. um, but yeah, I I love those guys, and um, yeah, any any chance I get to work on something with them, I will. Yeah, I'm a big Elvis Costello fan too. Uh, Me too. You know, I, that's the thing. I've been listening to heavy music my whole life, but I still love you know Elvis Costello, and I love Joe Jackson, and and uh, you know I know the the Cure is is your all time favorite band, and I yep. wanted to ask I wanted to ask um, how many times have you seen the Cure play live? I've only seen the. Hold on, Abel Baker Fox texted me right now. Hold on, let me move that. Uh, I've only seen the Cure play once. I was supposed to see them at least three other times. Um, the first time would have been in St. Louis on the Wish Tour. So that was like 92, right? So I was like 13. Yeah. And my sister was going, and I got a ticket to go with my sister. And I got, I, I got really bad grades. <laughs> and my parents, like, <laughs> grounded me. And I was like, fuck. So that was the first one. Um, and then another time... Um, I had a friend who was going to go with me to St. Louis the day after I got home from a tour. I drove all night from Denver and I got home and she was like, I'm sick. I don't feel like going. And I was like, oh, I cannot, I cannot oh, drive all the way to St. Louis by myself. You know, so it, it was like always like that. And then I finally did see them. Uh, what was that last trip they did? 2016? Yeah. Yeah. 20 something. Yeah. yeah. And they, and I honestly, I thought it was going to be too late. I thought I missed it. You know, I thought it was just going to be, garbage and i was gonna be yeah. bummed but they were so fucking good so good the set list was amazing they sounded like a million bucks and i like i can't wait for the next chance and uh, i hope i get it you know like i hope that yeah. happens <laughs> again. I, I, was, I was lucky enough to see him once in in 1996 i saw the wild mood swings tour uh in worcester massachusetts uh one of, one of my friends was a huge gear fan and he was like you want to go and i was like hell yes I, i'll definitely go and uh that was amazing for me, um, at that time, we were going to like, you know, a bunch of shows um, in, in that in that realm. Like we saw PJ Harvey and, and Sonic Youth and um, uh, yeah. Port Portis Head in Boston. And, and uh, that was like right around the those two years, like 96, 97. Um, just like just great music at, at that point. And I'm just lucky enough to see him, you know, back then. I know you probably wanted to see him in the 80s and 90s when, you know, yeah. in their heyday. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I I personally really like the Weirdo records. I really love Faith. I really love The Top, which, like, is nobody's favorite. I just love how bonkers it is and, like, how, um, I mean, just so many drugs. Like, I, you know, and at that point, it was just Robert Smith. Simon Gallup wasn't even on that record. Yeah. Um, and, like, I'm, I'm listening to, like, the uh nylon string guitar solo and piggy in the mirror and i'm like how the fuck did he do this he doesn't even remember writing it you know it's like <laughs> yeah. uh, it's so good it's so bonkers i love it and yeah. what's your what's your all-time favorite album by the cure it it might be the top just because of how weird it is but i'd say it's faith the top or pornography like those those are the three that are in constant rotation um yeah Honestly, I, I do know that Disintegration is their best record. That's totally fair. That's yeah. their best, most complete record. That's the one that everybody's going to say is number one. Um, but the three weirdos, I kind of like. Yeah, well, that's understandable. I, I mean, yeah. I don't think I don't think I've heard any Cure that I didn't like. So, uh, like I said, uh, and also when... there's some bad Cure. I mean, there is. Like the last two records have been pretty. Well, I don't think I've, well, all right. I take that back. I haven't heard the last couple albums, so so okay. uh, if if you're saying they're bad, then they they must be. <laughs> you know, I I really got my fingers crossed. I know they've got a new one that they say they're about ready to drop, and like I I really hope that it's got some magic moments. But it's been a while. It, it has. And, and uh, it, it's funny. Um, is is the song on Moving Mountains Vista Point? That's. Uh, Everyone slept but me and the cure. Did did yeah. that pass by a lot of people? Because obviously, when I heard it, I, was, I knew exactly what you were talking about. But did that kind of just like pass over people's heads? Probably, and I mean that's like a very clear memory I have of of uh, driving through the redwood forest where it's raining as a coalesce tour. Actually, no, no, no. I take that back. That was like the first Casca Lottery tour. Everybody's sleeping. And like, it's just me and I was listening to the cure and, and like, it's like just one of those 
moments, you know, that like sticks with you. Like when you like really realize like how impactful something is as it's happening, you know, that was, that was that moment for me. And I'm glad I wrote that down because I, oh, yeah. I, I get to I'm, revisit I'm it. I, you know? I mean, it kind of hooked me with the, with the lyric right there. I was like, yeah. Oh, this, this, this lyric is amazing right here. Yeah. Um, going back to casket lottery. Uh, how did you come up with the name, the casket lottery? It, it's from Merchant of Venice, uh, Shakespeare. Um, and I, I had that written down in a notebook um, from like my sophomore year of high school. I just knew that I, that I love that band name. I was like, I'm going to use that someday. So um, yeah, I kicked it around for a while and, and it, it was a, it was a no doubter as soon as we started. Yeah. Uh, now, what do your daughters think of, of the, your music career? And, and especially like, um, <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> well, well, I mean, if you show them a, a coalescent video where, where you know, especially the one on, my, like, anyone that, that yeah. where you're going pretty wild and so is Jess. And, and uh, wh what do they think of that? Do they, like, they think well, it's you dumb? Know, they... I'm sure that they think it's dumb, yes. But I also know that, like, they've heard stories from their mother, uh, my wife, who was, like, around during some of those shows and, and saying, like, yeah, they used to, like, you know, throw up while they're playing and spit on each other. And, and they're like, what the hell, dad? And I'm like, I, I don't know. It's a different time, man. I'm like, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, um, everybody's heard the, the the stories about the Pennsylvania shows. I'm not really going to tap into that at all. Um, but is there any shows that you remember that were really like wild and, and, and memorable for you that, that, you know, stick in your head? Um, because like I said, everybody's heard the, the, the bullshit about the the Pennsylvania shows and and obviously uh, back then there was no internet so things get you know over exaggerated and blah blah yeah. blah and this and this and that um, but for you um, what are a few shows that kind of stuck out in your head that were you know either wild or just like really really like something to behold man I don't know like I guess a couple things I don't have a great memory first of all so um we, and stacy on the other hand does so like stacy will always be like hey remember so and so in, in pennsylvania and we did this thing and something happened and i'm like holy shit man i totally <laughs> forgot about that and he like has like every detail he's like yeah yeah and that's where we met joe and i'm like holy shit I, I don't. so he like blows my mind and um you know cool shows were chaos uh, obviously and um sometimes violent and scary in retrospect like um some of those you know i look back and i think that, you know we were really lucky that we didn't hurt people or didn't get hurt ourselves or didn't get you know run out of town more often because <laughs> we did sometimes but um uh yeah, i think like the ones that i remember more fondly are the ones where um the chaos was like reciprocated and it was like met with like enthusiasm and appreciation and it was it was just fun chaos you know and um that happens you know i'd say more often in like smaller towns uh towns that didn't get shows very often uh, i remember one show specifically in roseburg oregon where like we played a school gymnasium and, you know, I, I think probably half the kids there had never been to a hardcore show. And when it was happening, it was just chaos. Like they were just like all in on it. And it yep. was just um, madness all around us. And um, I mean, and we were a broke, poor ass band at that point. And we were a mid tour and I smashed my bass at that show. Like that was like a very, like I, I didn't do that. Like that was not yep. a super common thing for me. I broke bases on accident often, but that was like chaos and I just did it. Yeah. And like, I, I did not have a plan. It was just one of those moments where it was like, this is happening all around me and it was fucking awesome. So <laughs> that show comes to mind. Um, and then on the Ox tour, like uh, another one that I, that I think about kind of often is um, we played a show somewhere in England at the, start of our tour and we were exhausted and everybody had already left England and went to France because uh Hellfest was happening and that's why we actually went over there so 
we kind of, we, we fucked up our planning and went to England and nobody was there, right? So there was like 15 people at the show probably, like maybe being generous. Yeah. And, and one, of the, one of the things on the rider for our European tour was a bottle of whiskey for Sean for his voice. Like he, at that point he was like, I need whiskey for my voice. So, um, so like at the start of that show, we just decided we had shot glasses like for everybody in the venue. And it was like everybody who worked there too. And like, we just had a tray of shots for everybody. And, and as soon as we hit that shot, it, the set started. And <laughs> I think, I think Sean threw the rest of the shots like in the air. And so like, we all had whiskey like in our eyes and like, it was just, it was just chaos. And, um, and it was so fun. Like uh, that was another one. Like, so like 15 people and it was probably the most memorable show for me on that whole European tour. Yeah. Do you do you remember any of the um, the New England shows uh, that you played, e e either with Coalesce or or the Casket Lottery? I know I saw you got uh, the Casket Lottery. Maybe I don't know what year it was. It was it was two thousand. Oh, I don't even know three maybe or something. I think it was at the Middle East. I'm not sure. Like I, like I said, uh, I'm that old. was around Mike. Uh, I think it was. Yes. Yeah. Um, I you know we did so much touring in such a short amount of time that like a lot of casket lottery shows just kind of run together. Yeah. Um, from that time period. Um, I, I guess I probably remember more coalesce shows, um, just because it was, um, when I was younger and I had fewer of them under my belt, you know, yeah. um, you know, there was one coalesce show that I think about often. Um, and I think it was on that, that, neurosis trip that we were talking about the one so when we played st john's gym we also did a show a couple nights before a couple nights after with that touring package that was like a relapse touring package so it was yeah. like neurosis today is the day dillinger escape plan and then a couple other bands like sprinkled in and out yeah. and we played one show i think it was a cmj show honestly at um uh coney island high and that was probably the best show of that trip. And, and like, I don't know, that was like just one show where everything felt great. And I'm always surprised. Like when I go snooping, like if I'm like, if I go to YouTube, I'm like, I wonder if like somebody's got that. Show. No, there's like, there's yeah. no evidence that show ever happened, you know? And that was like, that was one of my favorite Coalesce shows. And it's just, it was just a moment now, you know, kind of yeah. cool. Well, that's a, that's the thing. I mean, some things like come out of the, the, uh, you know, the the treasure chest though, because I all of a sudden on YouTube I've seen I've seen shows from like you know late '90s that I've never seen on YouTube before. So you never know, there might be somebody out there that's just trying to transfer tapes and like never never has gotten to it because uh li lately I've been seeing these weird converge shows from like the late '90s which I've never seen before, and then all of a sudden they're popping up popping up on YouTube like. A, a month or two ago which i've never seen before in my life so you never know somebody could have some hidden uh you know video footage that that they're just trying to transfer like 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 me i have a bunch of stuff still stuck on eight millimeter which it's just expensive to transfer it if you go through a company or or you have to buy like a shitty old sony camcorder to, to right. take take the chance on ebay that you know hopefully it won't eat your tapes you know <laughs> so um Right. So I checked for that one on occasion, but nothing yet. Yeah. Um, like I said, the one that, that I had posted, I'm pretty sure that was the Springfield show that um, you guys played. And, and I'm not sure who, I think today is the day played that show in, in grade and uh, oh, uh, maybe turmoil. Uh, I know it was like a big, big, like, you know, it was. It, like it a was, fest. Yeah. Well, somebody said a fest and I think it was just a show that had like, eight to ten like awesome bands and just uh from you know 6 p.m to maybe midnight you know what i mean i don't think it was a fest though i think it was just a yeah. jam-packed show that you know but uh um, yeah that's how you guys did it in new england i know that like <laughs> there was always seven bands playing yeah uh, in the in the late 90s that it was just, <laughs> i always have to tell people that they see a flyer and they're like oh my god are you kidding me and it's like it, it, it literally was like that up here every weekend, um, even back when, um, you know, late 80s, uh, when I was going to shows in Boston, it was the same type of thing. I mean, I saw 
um, you know, sick of it all, agnostic front, uh, you know, slap shot, uh, sometimes Mighty Mighty Boston's would play. It, it's just like shows that just had all these big bands all together in one one show. Um, I, you know, uh, we're lucky to, well, you know, I'm lucky that I got to see that stuff. And, um, yeah. and that was it, the era, right? Like, uh, you know, even, even the, um, you know, hardcore festivals that happened back then or uh, like more than music or, um, you know, the Michigan Fest festivals. Um, there's nothing like that anymore. I mean, I guess the closest is Fest in Gainesville. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, like, you know, Warp Tour kind of put an end to all of that. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and, and, and truth be told, it's probably really hard to to do that nowadays with, you know, just to get all those different bands and, and money and, and, you know what I mean? Sure. <laughs> you know the struggle back then where – there was no internet and you were doing everything by either writing a letter or tr hoping they had an AOL messenger name or, or getting somebody's phone number and, and calling them and being like, Hey man, like, uh, I know you have a venue there. Do you think we can play at this venue when we're on tour? I mean, the struggle back then was real, but it was almost funner back then to like, you know, get into it and do that instead of, you know, nowadays. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely, it was definitely harder. <laughs> uh i don't know about more fun i mean a lot of a lot of those tours were disasters you know like there was plenty of times you rolled into town and and that's when you found out that the, there wasn't a show or um you know i remember showing up to this place uh early casket lottery tour and like getting to it was a record store we were playing getting to the record store and the guy being like oh cool you're you guys are here we've driven all night to get there and we like had a stack of flyers he's like hey you guys can take these to the beach and we're like oh shit like you haven't flyered for the show yet and he's like no not yet i've been busy or whatever he said and yeah. we're like well nobody's gonna come last minute and he's like they will if it's free and we're like motherfucker <laughs> like we're trying oh, to like get gas money here like oh. it's a disaster, it's a disaster. Jesus. but but typical but typical right like that's that was just like how how it was done yeah yeah, definitely. Um, are you still working on some solo stuff? I know you had, uh, you know, a couple songs um, that were just you. Was that all the music by just you? Uh, no, I've always got like a trove. You know, I've got a pile of songs somewhere. Um, I, I don't really have plans to do that. Um, I'm definitely not like the guy who's ever just going to do a strummy acoustic guitar song. You know, like that's not my. Yeah that's not my thing at all like i i will do like um my own songs but it'll, it'll be um you know produced with other sounds and other things happening so yeah. i almost feel like it just makes more sense to play with other people you know yeah. like i'd rather just save songs for abel baker fox or casco lottery or whatever yeah, yeah definitely yeah. Makes sense. um Usually uh, at the end of the interview, I usually do a little rapid fire um, and ask you a few questions. So um, I'll, I'm uh, ready. Shoot you some rapid fire. Um, favorite New England um, punk or hardcore band from New England? That that could be like Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine. I know it's not the, that many bands in those other states, but uh... I feel like I'm gonna fuck this up. I'm going to think of something later. You know what? Can I say unsane? I'm going to say unsane. New York. No, New York's not New England. Fuck. <laughs> I mean, it could be like SSD, Converge. Um, you know what? I, how about this? I'm going to say early. And I'm going to be more specific about this. I'm going to say really early Caven. Those like first few split seven inches. I remember like going up to see them, like we were going to play a show with Cave In before, like this is before um, the records came out or anything, but like I had those first couple of splits and being super excited that they were on the bill. And that's when I met those guys and um, yeah. great guys. We played a lot of shows with them since then, but um, those first few seven inches blew my hair back. Yeah. yeah the, the seven inch with piebald, uh, I think. So good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is like Crossbearer and Chameleon are on that song. And I think like Crossbearer 
is probably like one of those iconic hardcore songs that just make you want to go like crazy when when you hear it uh, yeah. at least up here, up here so and um, and like and they of course they progressed to be a, a great band and you know the the first couple of full links they put out were fucking awesome too but like i remember like just those first couple of seven inches really that that, that was the sweet spot for me yeah, yeah yeah definitely um all right my second question what was the first punk hardcore show you attended like as a you know, person that walked in the door. I saw. I mean, it might not have been the first first one you saw, but like the first punk hardcore show where you were like, whoa, you know, like maybe there was washing going on that you had never seen or or something. You know, it might have been Engine Kid and Ice Burn at the Daily Grind in 95. I think that's it. But like the, right around that same time, I also saw like that was one venue here in Kansas City that was only open like maybe two summers. And I know that I saw Earth Crisis, Snapcase and Donuts, Bloodlet, 108, Coalesce, Neurosis, all those bands in this tiny room. So like that venue itself like changed my life. Yeah. 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 Definitely. That, that I think a- the first one, the first one was Engine Kit. That victory wave was like something back back then. It was uh, yeah. I, I was huge on integrity too. When the um, mm-hmm. when integrity came, system overload. I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Yeah. And, and the bloodlet, the bloodlet stuff kind of blew me away. And also dead guy. I was a huge dead guy fan too. But Earth yep. Crisis as well because back then, um, you know, that I was think, a big deal. Yeah, I think everybody was straight edge when Earth Crisis came out or started to become straight edge because it was such a huge wave. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But, but uh, all right, my my next uh, all time favorite punk hardcore show you played like the the number one show that you you know that goes in the books for you. That's I, I don't know. I mean, it could have been a casket lottery show, just one that you were like that. Now this show, maybe the crowd was like you played, you know, thousands and thousands of people, or or it, it just was the right feeling, and you were like, wow, that that show was amazing. I'm going to say Michigan Fest in what was either 99 or 2000 and Cascal already played. But also the reason it was so good was because Hot Snakes played, Karate played, Boys Life played, Kerosene 454 played, uh, you know, uh, The Swarm played, Grade played. You know, that's why. Because, like, uh, it was one of those weekends that was – all my friends were there and every band I saw was blowing my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, my next um, all time favorite punk hardcore show you attended, like just you as in the crowd wa- watching. Neurosis at the Daily Grind in 1996. Through Silver and Blood hadn't even come out yet. I don't think actually, I think I bought the CD at that show and, and they just played it front to back. And Daily Grind is like maybe, 150 capacity room and if you remember back then neurosis would roll in their scaffold so it was this giant like like (laughs) sound booth on wheels that they were shooting you know they're projecting um behind them playing and before that show like all the bands i had seen were like me like other skate kids who were like just playing hardcore and just singing along and i was like yeah this is great this is like uh i can do that you know it was like um it was not, I was not detached from what was happening. Whereas neurosis came in and scared the shit out of me and re- made me realize that like some people are like uh, a little more out there than me. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, my next question, what was the last movie you watched? I'm a huge movie guy. So I have to ask. Uh, Night of the Demon. Night of the Demon. I think so. Usually, with with us that have kids, I I usually get like a you know uh, Doctor Doolittle or something like See, that. See, my uh, kids are older. Like I don't know how old your kids are, but my kids are nineteen and fourteen. So like we're we're past Doctor Doolittle. Like, <laughs> that, we're not doing that anymore. In yeah, fact, my... like the last movie I watched with my kid was the the Changeling, nineteen eighty. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Nice, nice. Are they um, movie buffs or? Uh... Yeah, I, my youngest will watch movies with me. My oldest is 
uh, doesn't have the attention span for it. Not interested. Yeah, my daughters are uh, eleven and eight, so I'm still in that. In You're that Dr. Doolittle. But yeah. the, but they but they still want to watch you know every horror movie trailer they see they're like daddy can I watch that and I'm like nope not yet and they're like oh yeah. come on and I'm like no no not yet not yet yeah, yet. yeah. <laughs> um favorite horror movie of all time for you horror movie yeah favorite horror movie of all time I mean it might be. It might be The Shining. That, that's, I feel like that's a cop-out answer. Um, the reason uh, we watched The Changeling is because I love that movie, too. So it's like, it might be The Changeling. Um, man, I'm just, I'm just a huge horror movie guy. So I, and more specifically, anything from like late 70s to mid 80s. Like that's my, that's my jam. Yeah. Um, I, I do feel like there's been you know, some good ones. I think Hereditary is, oh, so I think that that's so good. And I think that that's maybe, I was, I was trying to tell somebody about it the other day. And I, I almost said like, it's the best horror movie since. And I couldn't like figure out like, what is <laughs> like, like, like what's more, more like within the last five, 10 years from her. I don't know. Like yeah. that one is, that one goes back to the shining for me. It's the same, feeling it's the same vibe right it's all about the tension throughout and then when it gets to the end it's just fucking bonkers right? it takes yeah. off on you and you're like what just happened yeah yeah I know, that movie's great it's fu it's funny yeah i said the same thing i hadn't seen i mean nowadays the horror movies are kind of like they're just boring to me i mean it's always a ghost story now and and you know that they, they stay in the house and blah 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 and it's been rehashed over and over and over again but hereditary literally probably the last five to ten years is the best horror movie that has ever come out and um i know the the other movie that ari astor did uh midsommar uh or midsummer some people say yeah um, i didn't love that as much as hereditary i think it was a little drawn out uh, it was it was crazy and bonkers too but like i i still go to hereditary before i would go to that movie yeah and i haven't seen midsommar yet um and kind of intentionally, you know, it's one that I like stop, stop on when I'm like looking for something to watch and I'm like, eh, I'm not, not into it yet. And Hereditary took me a while too. Like I'd, I had plenty of people say like, yeah, that fucked me up. And like, yeah. so like I had to wait till it was the right moment for me. And of course it fucked me up too. And like, I, that was like one of those nights after I watched it where like, I couldn't sleep after that, you know, I was like, God damn, that like did a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, I was going to say um, David Cronenberg, whose son, Brandon Cronenberg, I'm all, I always say this to everybody I talk to. Um, there's a movie called Possessor that Brandon just put out this year. I just and, heard about this. And, you, do you love it? I, I think it's the movie of the year by far. To me, okay. it's the movie of the year. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, such a smart movie. It's brutal. Don't get me wrong, because, I mean, his yeah. dad made brutal movies, too. And, and I heard it leak. I heard it leans too hard into David Cronenberg. I heard it like like he lives in his father's shadow in this movie. But that's okay. I mean, I, I'm a Cronenberg guy. Like I love Scanners. You know, and yeah, Dead Zone. Too. Dead Zone is like super underrated. I love yeah, that yeah. movie. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge I, I, Stephen King guy. So like, it, it, any uh, well done Stephen King adaptation is gonna like have a, a special place for me. So. Yeah, yeah, def definitely. Uh, did you did you enjoy Castle Rock? I know it yeah. was. I know Stephen King didn't write it, but it was based on his characters and stuff like that. I mean, were you into I, that? Yeah, I think each season had its moments. I thought like the end of season one was great, and season two had a couple of moments too. Like I was still, I was just trying to figure out what they were doing with uh, Annie Will. So I was like, wait, when is this happening? <laughs> like it was so. Like I and I still don't know. I still don't get it really, but um, but it's well done. Yeah. Yeah, de uh, definitely. Um, I got two more questions. Um, uh, I used to collect a lot of comics too. Um, so DC or Marvel for you? I, I dude, I couldn't tell you. I honestly like I never, I, I never bought a single comic book. I it just That's never funny. did. Like, yeah. which is weird because like all my friends did. I just it just never did a thing for me. So I yep. can't tell you. I, I couldn't even people. guess. I'd get it wrong. I'd fuck it up. I promise. <laughs> uh, and uh, my last question is, um, 
if you've been listening to hip hop, what have you been listening to lately for hip hop? If you are even a hip hop fan, uh, I'm not. Um, I, I did listen to the Run the Jewels record. Um, it has some great stuff on it, um, but I, I, it's just not something like I I listen to on a regular basis. So I I'm like not an expert at all. Um, I I love uh, I love Damn. I think that that record is incredible like just from a production standpoint my wife and kids listen to hip-hop you know so when when Kendrick Lamar put out that last record um it was playing and like I walked in the room and I was like what is this what are you listening to and like that first track on damn I still think is fucking incredible the ending of it when it just goes off um I think that production is like it's next level stuff. So, so I can appreciate it. It's just not something I listen to on a regular basis. Nice. Um, and one final question. Now, if, if Jess and Sean um, got in touch with you and was like, Hey, do you want to make another Coalesce record? Would you, are you, are you up for it or? Just so you know, like I'm the guy reaching out and having those conversations. Like <laughs> um, I, I, I've had to reach out a couple times over the last few years, like whenever like show offers come up or something. And, um, yeah, I I don't think it's ever going to happen. Just to like break it to you, like everybody's just in a different spot. Um, but I almost I thought that before too, before Ox. So you know, never say never. But um, it's definitely harder the older we get. Yeah, so. and that, and and that being said, do you ever have a fever for playing in a heavy band up beside with you know without those guys just breaking out and doing your own heavy heavy band? Um, do you have any wants to do that? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think that that's like, um, that's my comfort zone. Like I love um, anything that's uh, anything that's dark, anything that's loud and anything that's aggressive. Like that's like, that's my wheelhouse. Like, I, I mean, I think the new Castellari record has, has quite a bit of that. Um, it's, it's probably the most aggressive Castellari record. Um, and that's just, um, that's just how I write right now. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I could see doing a, another project like that at some point. That, that would be, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you so much for doing this. I know, I know like we both have families and, and things to do and, and I, and I really, really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me tonight and, and just, you know, going back, uh, you know, years and years ago and all, and also the new stuff, uh, uh, like I said, the new Casco Lottery album is is amazing, and if anybody hasn't heard it, that you know, you know, go out and buy it. I know the vinyl. You guys were talking about putting the vinyl out uh, very, very soon, right? Yeah, I mean, we ordered that in God, maybe May, and you know, just with with uh, uh, the coronavirus like safety procedures at the pressing plant, it like keeps getting delayed, but. Um, the, the latest I've heard is it's supposed to finish and ship to us on the, uh, the 17th, which is like next Friday or whatever. So whenever that happens, then we can like ship it out to, to all the pre-orders, which is, uh, yeah, I know it's been delayed. So I appreciate everybody's patience on that for sure. Yeah. And definitely if anybody hasn't heard it, go check it out. It's, it's, it's so, so good. Um, and once again, I want to thank you and, uh, you know, stay safe out there. Um, you know, and have a great holiday thanks man I, it was nice to meet you and uh we can talk horror movies anytime all right Hal. yeah definitely all right okay take care all right take care bye